With the quark model of 1964, a big step forward was made in the field of particle physics. For the first time, it seemed that a step towards simplifying the dizzying array of subatomic particles had been taken. Gelman had suggested that all baryonic and mesonic matter was made up of just three things, up quarks, down quarks, and strange quarks. Most of the stuff we see every day, things made of protons and neutrons, consisted of just up and down quarks, with only the very exotic forms of matter, things created in cosmic ray collisions and particle accelerators, including a strange quark. It was a reduction of complexity similar to the explanation of the periodic table using merely protons, neutrons, and electrons. The field theory developed to explain both nuclear interactions and quark-quark interactions, with gluons as the vector boson, was able to describe both how the nucleus could remain stable as well as how the quarks could be contained within the subatomic particles that comprise the nucleus and the mesons that held it together. It was, if it could be shown to be true through experimental confirmation, a triumph of physics. In the other area of particle physics research, that of particle decay, there were also fundamental advances that had been made. For the first time, it had been shown that there was an interaction that could change things about matter that no other interaction could. This property of the VA field theory gave hope that it was possible to explain particle change as something that was a property of the interaction. Additionally, the particle accelerator research pointed to another class of particles that were not made up of smaller quarks, the so-called leptons, which included electrons, muons, and neutrinos, now found in two types. All of this began to suggest that perhaps the dream of Democritus wasn't as far as fetched as it might have seemed. Maybe there were certain indivisible atoms, as opposed to the modern-day atoms, that were composites of smaller things. And these small, indivisible atoms could truly be thought of as the point-like building blocks of all matter. Maybe there was a description that would account for all of the diversity of form and functions we humans experience in our world that required only a few fundamental building blocks and the interactions between them. However, as alluring as compelling as such a description might be, there were still a number of details to be worked out. And in that working out, it would be discovered that the puzzle was a whole lot more interesting than anyone could have imagined. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 2, A History of the Atom. Episode 25, Putting the Puzzle Together. As we begin this episode, it is once again useful for us to take a small step back in order to set up the information in history that will be presented. In this case, it would behoove us to recall the broad theoretical construct of what we call quantum electrodynamics, or QED, as it is often referred to. By doing this, we'll be able to develop a framework to better understand what is to come. In QED, we have a theory that explains how certain types of matter interact with each other. Now, when we talk about matter, we need to have sort of a, a different idea of what that means. We need to move away from the old chemistry definition I think most of us have, which is limited to the types of things that are involved in chemical reactions and sort of related to the amount of stuff an object might be made of. We also need to move away from that Newtonian definition that's related to inertia, which described how hard it is to get an object to speed up or slow down. Our consideration of matter for these field theories involves us thinking in a somewhat different way. Matter is going to be anything that is a fundamental particle that has one of any number of different physical properties. These properties give rise to interactions with other pieces of matter that also possess one or more of those properties. 
So the properties of matter might include things like mass, charge, intrinsic angular momentum, a whole number of other things of that sort. Now as an example of properties and why knowing them is important, let's, let's think of something in the everyday world. Let's talk about vehicles. We might say that vehicles have a property we could call wheeledness or wheelage maybe. Now let's say this property counts the number of wheels a vehicle has. Most of the time when we look at a vehicle, at least here in the United States, we find that a vehicle has four wheels. Less often, but still not uncommonly, we see vehicles that have a state of two-wheeledness. Even less frequently, we might see three-wheeled vehicles. Finally, there are some exotic states of wheeledness, such as having one wheel, or six wheels, or even 18 wheels. And there are a few vehicles that have no wheels at all. Think of, say, sleds or hovercraft or something like that. Now, one of the things you might have noticed in our example is that the property of wheel vehicles called wheelage is what we call quantized. In other words, there's always an integer or whole number of wheels on the vehicle. You don't see any vehicles with only half a wheel or 1.654 wheels. It's always one or two or three or whatever. These wheels interact with the ground to determine, in some sense, the behavior of the vehicle while traveling along the ground. So in, under, in order to understand what behaviors are possible for a particular vehicle while traveling across the ground, you might determine the number of wheels in order to better understand that. These wheels, however, don't interact with the air in the way a wing would, and thus you really don't have to take into account the vehicle's wheelage in determining whether it might fly or not. To better understand that interaction, you might want to look at a property like wingage or wingedness. And the thing that's interesting is some vehicles might have both wheelage and wingage, meaning that it's going to interact with two different kinds of things, the ground and then maybe the air. So with that example in our back pocket, let's get back to reviewing the landscape. By the way, you see what I did there? All right. So, moving on. Recall that QED specifically talks about the property of matter that gives rise to the electromagnetic interaction and how that interaction takes place. In this case, the property of matter that is of interest is called electric charge, or usually you'll hear it just called charge. And that comes in two types, called positive and negative. Now, it is also quantized in that it comes in, a, in multiples of the charge of the electron. Now charge can't be created or destroyed either. And lastly, when an object is made up of multiple charged objects, you can combine the charges by adding them to find the charge of the composite object, which then behaves as if it had that total charge. The atom is an ex excellent example of this behavior. If we look at a carbon atom, we know that it has six positive protons in the nucleus, six neutral neutrons in the nucleus, and six negatively charged electrons around the nucleus. When we add up all the charges in a typical carbon atom, we get zero net charge, and we can say that the atom is electrically neutral. What this means is that as a bulk ob object, the carbon atom will not really interact with an electromagnetic field unless the field is strong enough to begin to affect the individual charges that make it up. This combination behavior of a property of matter will be really important down the road in a little bit. What we know is that a charge give ri gives rise to something called the electromagnetic field, which is also the thing it interacts with. The electromagnetic field can create force carriers, things called intermediate vector bosons, that exchange momentum between the pieces of matter that have the property of charge that creates a change in the motion of the charged object. This whole entire process is called the electromagnetic interaction as a blanket term, and one of the things that we know that the interaction does or doesn't do is it doesn't destroy or change the charge of the piece of matter. The boson that transmits the interaction is called the photon, something we've been talking about off and on for quite a while now. Now, if a piece of matter does not possess the property of charge, as would be the case with something like a neutrino, then it will not interact with particles that do through the electromagnetic interaction, as I mentioned a bit earlier. 
This is the main reason that neutrinos are so hard to detect and why they're able to penetrate through thousands and thousands of miles of solid matter. They don't interact with the charged electrons and protons through the electromagnetic interaction and thus aren't generally influenced by them. In fact, the sun creates untold billions of neutrinos a second in the nuclear fusion reactions that take place at its core. These neutrons leave the sun in under two seconds and stream outward in all directions, including towards the earth. Right now, as you are listening to this, thousands of neutrinos are streaming through your body every second, passing harmlessly through you. With the development of renormalization in 1948, QED became the most powerful theory in making predictions of the behavior of matter that possessed the property of electric charge and interacted with photons. As such, it became the standard by which all other quantum theories and models were judged, and unfortunately, all of these other theories were found to be lacking. The Fermi interaction was not renormalizable at all due to being a contact force, and the strong interaction didn't seem to have convergent path integrals. Nevertheless, particle physicists knew that whatever interaction models replaced these two things would have to be fairly similar in form, either mathematically or physically, to the models they were replacing, as those original models both had shown a good deal of success in predicting the behavior of nuclear systems, even with the problems that they possessed. Now, as I've mentioned in previous episodes, sometimes the thing science needs is just more data taken by more powerful instruments. Cosmic ray observations using cloud chambers provided some of that data, leading to the discovery of new particles with higher energies and greater masses. But it was really the construction of more and more powerful particle accelerators that took particle physics from being an observational endeavor back to being the experimental process Rutherford had pioneered at the Cavendish with nuclear physics. Now a quick note is in order here before we go any further. In our discussion, I'll be making reference to particle masses as being light or heavy. These, of course, are relative terms. But it should be understood that in this context, at this point in our story, mass and energy are really equivalent things. When Einstein published the Special Theory of Relativity in 1905, he was able to demonstrate this equivalence. As such, it is very common to see particle masses represented in a unit of energy known as an electron volt, which is the amount of energy an electron acquires when it's accelerated through the potential difference of one volt. It's a very tiny amount of energy, but using the E equals mc squared formula, we can represent a particle's mass as an amount of energy in electron volts. In other words, it's the amount of energy that it would take to create that mass. During the 1950s, as particle accelerators came online and then became more powerful, they would give particles more kinetic energy, i.e. make them move faster, which could, through collision with other particles, be used to create new kinds of particles with more and more mass. This research was really important for two reasons. First, one of the things that's interesting about nature is that it favors processes that lower the amount of stored energy. This has something to do with a thing called entropy and nature's seeming desire to increase that quantity. If we ever do a more in-depth series on thermodynamics, I'll say a whole lot more about energy, but for now, we'll just have to leave it at that. Since high mass particles are really lots and lots of stored energy, they want to decay into lower mass particles. The bigger the particle is, the faster that decay happens at least most of the time. This allows a particle physicist to study what types of processes were allowed or favored, which would then give insight into the interaction that could or would cause the decay to take place. In examining these decays, what was found was that they didn't obey certain symmetry rules that processes involved in the other three interactions did. This ability to break the rules told something about this decay-causing interaction. As we've mentioned previously, the VA interaction that replaced the Fermi interaction took this rule-breaking ability into account when creating a mathematical model of what was going on, but it still suffered from many of the same problems. 
It wasn't clear what the field would be in the interaction, or what the force carriers were, or what they would do in order to cause the particle decay process to happen. There were still lots of pieces of the puzzle missing. Fortunately, the accelerators were churning out lots and lots of new data, and that created lots and lots of new pieces to fit together. And that's exactly what Gelman and Zwig did with the Eightfold Way, and then in proposing the idea that baryons and mesons were made up of smaller things they called quarks. The evidence for such a model had been accumulating for a little while. One of the ways this data sort of came about is as follows. When you shoot in particles with higher and higher energy, they get better and better at seeing things in greater detail as long as they don't break up into lots of little things themselves. Both photons and electrons are really good for this sort of thing. And when high energy electrons are shot at photon targets, they had bounced off of, or to use the term that Rutherford had coined not so long ago, scattered from the proton in such a way that might have suggested that there might be some kind of structure to what was thought to be an elementary particle. This insight, along with the ability to explain some of the emerging particle data, is what led to the proposal of three different quarks that made up mesons as a combination of a quark-antiquark pair and baryons as a collection of three quarks. Gelman thought that these things were merely a mathematical artifice used to explain the data, while Feynman believed that the quarks really did exist. As the electron scattering experiments continued at higher higher energies, the data more clearly showed an underlying structure, something that was in strong support of Feynman's view. However, one would also expect that as the particle collider experiments that ran baryons into other baryons also became more energetic, they would eventually pop a quark or two loose to be observed in the various detectors arrayed around the colliders. That no such observations were made forced the theorists back to their chalkboards to develop a field theory that would explain what was going on. Before I go further, I should explain that I've had a lot of difficulty untangling the details of the history from this point forward, especially regarding the development of the weak interaction after the VA theory. While finding sources that explain the science in more or less understandable terms is certainly possible, getting an historical perspective that not only discusses the work of the major innovators, but also the smaller but still important contributions in a proper context has really been quite difficult. What I will endeavor to do going forward, therefore, is to try to lay out the science in a somewhat historical way with the caveat that I expect the picture to be actually a good bit messier than I'm letting on and thus probably a lot more interesting. I should also note that in the interest of actually getting this series wrapped up before the year is out, I'm leaving out a lot of the really interesting experimental work that these discoveries rest on. For those who would like to know more about that side of things, especially from the point of view of the folks at Columbia and then the Fermilab Accelerator, I would again recommend Letterman's book, The God Particle. And as an aside, if there are any independently wealthy listeners that would like to support a poor podcaster in his search to discover the history of particle physics done between about 1955 and 1985 in a way that would allow him to quit his day job, drop us a note here at the podcast, you know, through our website or Facebook page, and we'll see if we can come to some sort of an arrangement. Okay, so back to the narrative. As a field theory, it is assumed that the strong interaction would involve a property of matter and some sort of intermediate vector boson. At first, it was thought that the property of matter that might be relevant here was the type of quark being discussed. Each type 
was said to be called or have a different flavor or to be said to have unique flavor charge in an allergy to QED. The boson that carried the interaction was called the gluon. At first, this all seemed to be progressing fairly similarly to QED, but soon a series of snags were run into. First, while the theory was renormalizable, the coupling constants for the path integrals didn't converge even a little bit. What this meant was that the interaction seemed to be too strong in a sense. The second particle was that as the quarks had spin numbers of one half, they had to obey the Pauli exclusion principle, something that having two up quarks in the proton would violate. This second problem was eventually solved by suggesting that the strong force actually involved a completely different property of matter than quark flavor charge. What the mathematical models that were developed suggested was that there was another property that came in three kinds. As a baryon, each of the quarks would have a different one of these values. This property was eventually called color because of the similarity to everyday color mixing. It should be understood, however, that quarks don't actually have what we would normally perceive as color. Rather, this was a device that allowed particle physicists to talk about the property of matter in the math in a shorthand and easily understandable language. Just as electrical charge comes in two types, positive and negative, color charge comes in three types, red, blue, and green. When a baryon, such as a proton, is built out of three quark, it has to have one of each color of quark. Thus, a proton might have one blue up quark, one red up quark, and one green down quark. When this property is examined for the whole proton, the three colors will mix and will look white, kind of like the pixels on your computer monitor. If you look really closely, you'll see the individual red, blue, and green pixels, but if you're far enough away, the three individual colors mix and all you see is sort of white on your screen. For mesons, a blue up quark is bound with an anti-blue, anti-up quark to make the meson white. As a result of this new property of matter, the field theory was eventually dubbed quantum chromodynamics, or QCD. The new theory also dealt with the strong coupling coefficient by suggesting that this is, in fact, the way the physical interaction actually works. If, there is, if this is true, there are two fundamental consequences for the interaction. The first is known as confinement. This says that the interaction strength between the quarks doesn't get smaller as they're separated. Instead, as you try to pull two quarks apart, the energy released from the strong field is great enough to create the mass of a new quark-anti-quark -quark pair, usually seen in the form of a new meson, such as you call as pion. This would explain the inability to directly detect free quarks in collider experiments. The second consequence is called asymptotic freedom, which by the way is I think a term you should endeavor to drop into your next random sports conversation that you might have somewhere like at the office or something. What this means that is if you create a very high energy environment, the strength of the strong field will get actually really small as the quarks and their interaction carrying gluons get close together. A few very recent particle accelerator experiments have reported achieving this state where what is known as a quark gluon plasma forms allowing for truly bizarre forms of matter involving four or even five quarks to be assembled. This last particle was just recently announced as having been discovered at CERN. This prediction of QCD was first made in the early 1970s independently by David Pulitzer and Frank Wilczek and David Gross, and they were awarded the 2004 Nobel Prize in Physics following the first successful observations of the plasma. By the way, one suggestion for dropping the term into that sports conversation would be to say something like, did you see that football achieve asymptotic freedom in the scrum of players during the fourth quarter yesterday? That was awesome. And we science types wonder why we occasionally end up seeing the inside of our lockers in high school.
So, while all this progress was being made with the strong interaction, what was going on with the weak side of things? Shortly after Gelmon's three quark model was put out, Sheldon Glashouse suggested that there should be a fourth flavor of quark that he called charm. And yes, this is yet another whimsical name for a particle physics thing. This suggestion was the result of progress that was being made in developing a renormalizable field theory that mirrored QED for the weak interaction. What was realized was that even though a particle's flavor charge wasn't responsible for allowing the particle to interact via the strong force, it did seem to be the thing that created the weak interaction. What the weak interaction seemed to be able to do with its ability to violate various symmetries was change a particle's flavor. In other words, the weak interaction allowed, or better yet, facilitated a slightly more massive down-flavored quark to change into a slightly less massive up-flavored quark. By the way, isn't this terminology just delicious? I feel like I should be using my Julia Child's voice when talking about this stuff. Anyway, since a neutron is made up of two down quarks and an up quark, the weak interaction can change one of the down quarks into an up quark, an electron, and an anti-electron neutrino. What this looks like from the outside of the neutron, of course, is that the neutron changes into a proton, which is two up and a down if you're keeping track, an emitted electron, and the anti-neutrino, exactly what Pauli and Fermi had suggested in the 30s and Raines and Cowan observed in 1956. To use our analogy from the beginning of the podcast, the weak interaction seemed to have the ability to change the four-wheeled car into a two-wheeled bicycle, a unicycle, and a really fast-moving Roomba. Now, why would nature want to do this? Remember, nature hates having stored energy, even if that's energy stored in the form of mass. Thus, if a system can go from having a higher mass to a lower mass by changing its quarks from one flavor to another, it will do that a certain percentage of the time. What's even more interesting is that if a particle has more than one decay path, it can take each of them a certain percentage of the time. When the probabilities for decay of the strange quark were calculated, it turned out that there had to be another quark to make things balance out correctly. This also brought out something of a symmetry in the particle numbers. Particles that are made out of quarks are called hadrons. If you're made out of two, you're a meson. If you're made out of three, you're a baryon. And if you're made out of more than that, then you're in the middle of the CERN Large Hadron Collider as part of a quark gluon plasma. But it turns out that the things we call leptons aren't made out of quarks at all. They seem to be fundamental in the same way as the quarks in that they aren't made up of smaller things. But unlike quarks, they don't possess the property we call color charge, so they don't clump together via the strong force to form bigger particles. Now these leptons include the electron and its neutrino and the muon and its neutrino. What's interesting is that each neutrino will only act, or interact I should say, with its charged lepton particle via the weak force. So if you're counting, that's a total of four flavors of leptons to go with our now four flavors of quarks. Up and down quarks sort of go with the electron and its neutrino in what's called the first generation of elementary particles. They're kind of the lightest ones. The strange and charm quark, both of which are more massive than the up and down quark, go with the muon, which is more massive than the electron, and the muon neutrino in a second generation of elementary particles. Now this is where things start to get pretty interesting. In a previous episode, we talked about the fact that the weak interaction could be used to explain why there's more matter than antimatter in the universe. In order for this to work in the mathematical models, the Japanese theorists Makoto Kobayashi and Toshihide Maskawa showed in 1973 that there would need to be a third generation of particles. While this was initially little more than a hypothetical speculation sort of thing, one of many such attempts floating around at the time. In a series of experiments conducted between 1974 and 1977, Stanford linear accelerator physicist Martin Lewis Pearl was able to isolate a series of anomalous events 
that indicated the formation of a new charged lepton that he called the tau, that had a mass greater than that of the muon. This discovery spurred off both theoretical and experimental work to search for the two quarks and one neutrino that would complete a third generation as suggested by the two Japanese physicists. Initially, the quarks were to be called truth and beauty, but it turns out that this was just a bridge too far when it came to the whole naming thing. And so now they're more sensibly, if less prosaically known as the top and bottom quark. The bottom quark would be discovered in 1977 by Letterman at Fermilab, and the top quark was discovered in 1995 at the same facility. The tau neutrino would have to wait until 2000 to be seen in the collider data. This, however, has been a bit of a digression, so let's get back to the weak interaction. The work to develop a renormalizable version of the weak interaction dates all the way back to the late 1950s with work Julian Schwinger did with the electromagnetic field theory. By theoretically confining QED to just one dimension, he saw deep similarities between it and the VA interaction model. From this, he was able to suggest for the first time that, much like Maxwell had shown that the electric force and the magnetic force were actually two manifestations of a deeper interaction we now know as electromagnetism, the electromagnetic and weak interactions might be related in a similar sort of way. Schwinger's graduate student, the aforementioned Sheldon Glashow, took up this work and in 1961 was able to show that there would have to be three bosons as part of the interaction. The first two, called the W plus and W minus, had already been suggested in earlier models as being necessary for conserving charge in weak interactions. Glashow said that there would be a third boson, called the Z0, that would allow for neutral particles to participate in the interaction. It was from certain requirements of the mathematics in this work that Glashow was able to suggest the necessity of a fourth flavor of quark. This work would be picked up and carried forward by Indian physicist Abdus Salam, who would continue the mathematical development in the model, and Glashow's high school classmate, Steven Weinberg. Together, the three would, along with contributions from John Clive Ward and Jerry Goldstone, show that under higher energy conditions that than presently exist naturally in the universe, the electromagnetic interaction and weak interaction would become the same thing. However, as the environment cooled, there would be what was known as a breaking of a particular symmetry property that would separate the two interactions into physically distinct things. One way to think of it might be to say that at high environmental energies, electric and flavor charge are the same property of matter, and that only one boson would be needed to transmit the interaction in a unified field. It's a little like saying in our early example, Wings and wheels would be the same thing. However, as the amount of energy available in the environment decreased, electric charge broke away from flavor charge, and now there were two interactions that required four different bosons, the photon for the electromagnetic and the two W particles and the Z particle for the weak. One of the big questions regarding this new picture was why the three weak interaction bosons had lots of mass while the electromagnetic interaction boson had none. To explain this, Weinberg pulled a theoretical rabbit out of the hat by going back to the work of six physicists who had attempted to explain how the property of matter we call mass might arise in different amounts in different fundamental particles. I think it's important to mention the names of all six men who contributed to the work for reasons that will become apparent shortly. Francois Englert, and Robert Brout published their work in August of 1964. Peter Higgs' work was published in October of that same year, and a joint paper by Gerald Gorolnik, Carl Hagen, and Tom Kibble was released in November. The three groups, if one can call Higgs a group, independently developed an explanation that suggested that there was another field that particles could couple to more or less strongly. The more strongly a particle coupled to the field, the more mass it would have. The reason Peter Higgs is so well known in this discussion, 
often to the exclusion of others, is that he suggested that this coupling occurred via a specifically scalar as opposed to vector boson. What this means is that the Higgs boson would have a spin value of zero as opposed to all other bosons that we know of that have values of one. This Higgs boson was also given a mo another more infamous name in Leon Letterman's book, The Guard Particle, which has served as a source of information for this podcast of late. As one might imagine, Letterman created a great deal of controversy with this appellation, something that he now kind of regrets. What Weinberg did was work out how the Higgs boson would couple with the unified electroweak interaction as the charge symmetry was broken to give the vector bosons of the weak force mass. Since all elementary particles possess the property of flavor charge and weak isospin, they all interact with these bosons and thus are thought to acquire the mass through that interaction. While this idea was further developed by other theorists, it's generally considered to be the beginning of what was now known as the standard model. With the experimental verification of the Z0 boson in 1977, and the actual observation of all three of the weak forces bosons in 1983, the standard model has achieved the status of being the dominantly accepted description of all matter in the universe. This status was given an enormous boost in 2013 when two groups working at CERN's Large Hadron Collider announced the detection of the Higgs boson at precisely the predicted mass energy with the properties predicted by the model. Research is ongoing to determine more of the boson's properties, but to date, there is nothing about the particle that's not explained by the standard model theory. So, as we come to the conclusion of the series, where do we find ourselves at the end of our first extended voyage? In a sense, we're back to where we started. Democritus suggested that the universe was made of tiny, indivisible particles that, through their interactions and combinations, formed all that we see and experience. Each of these particles had a specific set of properties that determined the physical characteristics of the things that they made. The standard model says that there are 24 of these atoms, six quarks, six leptons, and their antiparticle pairs. And these make up everything in the universe with the vast majority of the things coming from the atoms in the first generation of particles. They interact through four fundamental interactions by exchanging bosons that transfer momentum between them depending on the various properties they possess. It seems like a very beautiful theory founded on a complex and intricate set of mathematical models developed using and supported by mountains of empirical evidence. It is bizarre beyond comprehension in some ways, but also powerfully predictive in what it allows us to understand and manipulate to create our modern world. It is the best theory that we have at this time. But is it right? That's a hard question to answer. What the standard model really is, is the best, most tested idea we have right now. It explains almost everything we see in the universe, from the largest galactic clusters to the smallest subatomic particles. It is a towering achievement of the human intellect. But isn't that what the chemists might have thought in the 1870s as Mendeleev's table was taking shape? Or Bohr and Rutherford on the edge of the outbreak of the Great War with the old quantum model? Perhaps such an assessment could have been made at the 1927 Solvay conference with the Copenhagen interpretation just before Dirac wrote the first relativistic quantum field theory. Scientific inquiry has a way of arriving at an answer and then pushing beyond it to find things that were previously hidden. The process seems to naturally uncover deeper realities that incorporate and supersede our previous understandings that then lead us to new discoveries and a seemingly never-ending parade of progressive revelation. So what questions remain? Well, have we really found the most elementary particles now? The highest energy probing of quarks and leptons have revealed no additional structure, 
But that doesn't mean that when we crank up our collider machines to even higher and higher energies than we've already obtained, we won't find some evidence that maybe quarks and leptons are made of even something smaller. Two dozen different atoms sure seems like a lot. And I think everyone would be a lot happier if there was something simpler at the heart of it all. Another question that could be asked is, is the model really as tidy as it seems? Not really. Remember that we've absorbed a lot of infinities into the various physical constants of things we observe in order to do that renormalization process. A lot of theorists think that there should be a much tidier way to deal with those. It seems inelegant to have to put in the mass and charge of an electron and all sorts of other little things. I think it's like 17 different quantities. To have to put those in by hand rather than having the theory tell you what they should be from first principles. Another question is, is it universal? In one sense, the original sense, yes it is. We find nothing in all of our observations that contradicts what the model predicts anywhere in the universe. This has been most dramatically confirmed in the measurements of the proton to electron mass ratio done for various molecules observed in distant galaxies. This ratio has been shown to be the same as what it is observed to be here on the Earth within one part in 10 million, which is the limit of our instrumental precision. However, the quantum approach to unifying the fields has not been universally applied. While the electromagnetic unification was shown to be renormalizable in 1999 by Gerardus de Hoft and Martinus Veltman, we haven't been as successful beyond that in unifying the strong interaction in a mathematically self-consistent way. While progress has been made in this area using simpler models to try to understand the features of such a grand unification, it remains an area of active research. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, we found no way to represent the gravitational interaction using a quantum field theory approach. At present, it's the other pillar of modern physics, Einstein's general theory of relativity, that best explains gravity, and all attempts to quantize this have failed. Given these shortcomings, a number of extensions or replacements to the standard model have been proposed. One such extension is known as supersymmetry, but the most recent data from the LHC seems to rule out many of the supersymmetry approaches as the particles that are predicted to be have been created in that theoretical approach have not been found. The other, perhaps best known alternative to the standard model is known as string theory. This idea, which may have originated in the work of Albert Einstein and Paul Dirac, but is usually credited to Jeffrey Chu, suggests that particles may be thought of as arising from tiny, one-dimensional objects called strings. These objects have the ability to vibrate, and it is these vibrational modes that give rise to the various properties of matters we observe. While this model framework has been the subject of an enormous amount of theoretical and mathematical research, it suffers from the deficiency that it does not produce testable predictions, leading many to question whether the work of science, mathematics, philosophy, or something entirely different altogether. As we have seen over and over on our voyage of discovery here, as we gather more data, we may well find that our present understanding doesn't completely describe the fullness of the physical reality around us. And until then, we'll continue to search and dig to see what we might come up with. And so this brings us to the end of our narrative. For the last 11 months, and now over 200,000 words, we've explored the history of humankind's search to understand the nature of the stuff the universe is made of. Over the next few weeks, I'd like to add a few supplemental episodes devoted to topics both biographical and philosophical. We need to dive down into the Bohr-Einstein debate, as that will introduce us to the idea of quantum entanglement. We also have to talk about Erwin Schrodinger and the world's most famous cat. Finally, we should spend a little bit of time thinking about what it means to have theories that attempt to explain things we can't actually observe. Thanks for coming along for this voyage. As we put into port here, 
We'll reprovision and resupply and tell a few tall tales of our adventures, maybe over something distilled from Jabir's Olympic. In any case, be sure to catch your breath, because when we next set out, we'll venture into the deepest ocean humanity's ever encountered. Until next time, full sails on your journey.